Okay, so here we are, first and second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. This is lesson number 12, and the title of this lesson is Be Ready. Be Ready. Okay, so far in these two letters, so now you know, we're going to summarize a little bit, and finish up the last chapter, um, and I would direct you to uh, second Thessalonians chapter three. If you're following along in your Bibles, please go there. So far in these two letters, Paul has done uh, several things. First of all, he's given thanks for their faithfulness in spite of persecution and trials. This particular church had been you know, subjected to trials and persecution and Paul gives thanks that they have remained faithful despite all of this. Secondly, he defended his own conduct against false accusations. So apparently there were accusations that he was a charlatan, some sort of fake, you know, so he you know, he, um, he defends his ministry among them. And then, of course, the bulk of the uh, material, he instructs them concerning the return of Jesus. And so, uh, first of all, he, he talks about before Jesus returns, he says, you know, certain things have to happen. The apostasy, remember the falling away, and the man of lawlessness, not the man of lawlessness appears, but the man of lawlessness is revealed. Those two major ideas have to take place before Jesus returns. And then he goes ahead and talks about what's going to happen when Jesus returns. The believers are caught up with those uh, who are living, caught up to be with the Lord in the air, the wicked are punished, so on and so forth. Again, we've talked a lot about that. And then he also encourages them to remain steadfast in the meantime. So I've told you what's going to happen before Jesus, or what must happen before Jesus returns. I've told you what's going to happen when He does return. And in the meantime, he says, in the meantime, you have to remain steadfast. Continue <coughs> believing the truth and follow the path of truth in order to avoid the destruction awaiting those who follow lies, uh, the path of lies and deception. Okay. So after all of this, he leaves them with two final exhortations as he closes out the epistle, the same two exhortations that I want to give you as we close out this uh, series. So let's go to chapter three, Second Thessalonians, and let's begin reading verse one. It says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. So Paul has you know, begun this letter by praying for them, and so now he closes the letter by asking them to pray for him. And he guides them in the things to pray for. In verse one he says, uh, he wants them to pray that the gospel will grow and spread as it did with them. And I might put in parenthesis here, church growth begins with prayer. If I go to a, a church and, uh, and I'll do a seminar about church growth, and because churches want to know, what do we need to do in order to grow? You know, we've been kind of you know, stagnant. What are the things that we need to do? The first thing they need to do is to start praying for it. That's like the very first thing to do. And that's what Paul is saying to them here. Pray, pray that the gospel spreads. Make that a specific prayer. In verse two, he said he prays or he asks them to pray that, that Paul will be delivered from those who oppose the gospel because of lack of faith. And there's always opposition to the gospel, isn't it? In the world, you know, there's always pushback. You ever notice, you don't get any pushback until you, you step out and try to do something. I always uh, encourage the elders you know, when we're talking and so on and so forth, and, and I tell them, the moment you decide to step out in faith is the moment that the trouble is going to start. So long as we're casually sitting back and coasting along, everything is great. You know? The minute you get an idea for a great project or stepping out in faith or doing something big, you know, that's, the, that's the time when the pushback's going to come. So at least don't, don't be discouraged, you know? don't be afraid, just be ready for it. But it's the same thing in our own lives. The day you say, you know, I'm going to get a hold of this whatever, habit, this thing, whatever, the day you decide, this is it, that's the end of that, no more of that, boy, that's the day that <laughs> The, the roof caves in, you know, literally. 
the roof caves in, when you decide that you're going to take some instruction of the Lord more seriously, so on and so forth. And then in verse three, uh, he uh, reassures them concerning the things that he has spoken. Be assured, he said, everything I told you is all going to happen. You know, the man of lawlessness revealed, Jesus comes, you know, be assured that all of this is going to happen. So Paul knew that the gospel and God's powerful tool is God's powerful tool to save man, but prayer is what keeps the gospel in motion and keeps it spreading. You can't save a person just by praying for them. Can't do that. Somewhere along the way, you have to preach the gospel to them. You, know, you, pray, you, know, you pray for your brother-in-law, and he's not a member of the church, he's not, a, he's not a Christian, and you're praying for him, and you're praying for him, and that's good. But until you kind of face him with the gospel, what the gospel is, he's not going to be saved. You can't, you can't pray somebody into heaven. Your prayer may open an opportunity. Your prayer may you know, set the scene for you to kind of share your faith or you know, something like that. But somewhere along the line, you or somebody has to give him the details of the gospel. You're a sinner, you're lost, Jesus died for you. You, know, you need to believe in him. You need to express that faith in repentance and baptism. You know, and you need to do that as soon as you can. So that's, you know, that's, that's we, without that message, people are not saved. They have to know the terms of their salvation. They have to be confronted with the painful truth that unless they obey the gospel and follow Christ, they're lost. We have to risk telling them this and take the chance that they're going to be mad at us or reject us or humiliate us. You really believe in that stuff? I remember my cousin uh, Pierre, um, uh, PhD from uh, a highfalutin university in uh, Paris. And I remember having to stay at his house once. I, I flew back to Montreal. I think it was while my mom, mom was sick and I kind of crashed at his house while I was taking care of my mom. And we got to talking and he looked at me. I mean, we grew up together. We used to play hockey as kids, you know, and we, we grew up together. And he, you know, it was midnight, 1 a.m. in the morning. We're just talking, just talking, two cousins you know, talking. And he looks at me dead. I, and don't forget, this is Dr. Pierre here. Dr. Pierre. And he looks at me and he says, you don't really believe that nonsense about the virgin birth, do you? I mean, really? Come on. Michel, you know, that's my French name. Michel, you, you really? I get it if you do that for your people in the church. You know? I mean, a guy's got to earn a living, so you got to toe the party line. But you, you, my, you, you don't really believe that, do you? I said, oh yeah, absolutely. And he just, you dolt. You fool. You know, he, we didn't even continue the conversation because on his face it said, no, he was talking to this guy. He drank the Kool-Aid. So sooner or later, you're going to have to get to that moment with somebody. And, 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 and Paul is saying here, through prayer, many times sooner <laughs> happens. Sooner happens. So there is no salvation without the gospel. But there is no gospel being sent without prayer. I mean, Jesus Himself prayed that God would send the workers, right? Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, Matthew 9, 37. Uh, and then in the last verses in the passage that we read, Paul reminds them that God will answer their prayers. And in answer to their prayers, God will not only guard him, but will also guard the church and help the church to grow in love and perseverance. So these then are the type of things that we should also be praying for ourselves, not just things. I mean, it's important we pray for health because you know, as you get older, you, know, uh, you, you get sicker and more sore and so on and so forth. So it's natural to be praying you know, for good health and your children are growing up and you want them to do well and your grandkids are sick and you know, it's of course. But let's make sure that we add another dimension to our prayers also and pray for the, quote, the church as well, that it grows and that it be healthy and that it prosper and that, Lord, show me what I can do in order to contribute you know, to what everyone else is contributing to build up your kingdom. Ask yourself, what am I doing to build up the kingdom? What, what am I doing to build up the kingdom? Very important. All right, so then Paul describes the problem they are having and how to handle it in verse six. He says to them that they should 
uh, remain uh, busy in doing good. They should remain aloof, means to mark off a, a boundary from those who are living disorderly lives. In other words, they're not living according to what they had been taught. And I'll read that passage, uh, passage in a second. Uh, what had they been taught so far? Well, they had been taught faithfulness, good works, active in prayer, pure sexually, not to unnecessarily be a burden to other people. You, know, you have to remember that in the first letter, Paul had admonished those who were not working to get busy and quietly support themselves. Apparently, there were some that believed that the end was at hand. And uh, remember I said in the, first, in the first letter, these Christians in the first century, um, they thought Jesus was coming back like soon. You know, he said he would come back. Okay, when's he coming? This week? Next month? You know, he's coming back. In my lifetime, this is going to happen. It was assumed that he would happen. So a lot of people just kind of slacked off and says, well, you know, I might as well not build the new business or I might as well not buy that second fishing boat because Jesus is returning and you know what, there's no purpose to it. And, and, and the church started to get lazy and he, you know, a lot of his uh, thrust in his first epistle is saying, you, know, you need to get busy. You know, we don't know when he's going to return. I'll tell you what's going to happen when he returns, but we, know, we don't know when that's going to happen. So by the time we get to the second Thessalonian letter, there are still some who are under that impression that Jesus is coming anytime and they're not getting busy. So he makes this admonition. So in this letter, Paul, in the name of Jesus, commands the church to take action against these people. So in the first letter, he warns the whole church to stay busy. In the second letter, some people have not you know, responded to his admonition. So now he says to the church, here's what you're going to need to do about these people that are slacking off, not busy, you know, busy bodies, getting in everybody's business, you know, and so on and so forth. In this section, he describes five things that they should be busy doing. So number one, remain aloof in verse six. Let me just read verse six to you. He says, now, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. So we've already mentioned this one, right? They're to note and withdraw from lazy, undisciplined, unrepentant Christians so that their behavior is made public and dealt with. This is not a very easy thing to do, but it's very effective when done in a proper and uh, loving way. So number one, stay aloof. Draw a mark between yourselves and those people who are uh, unruly, not living the Christian life. They're proclaiming that they're Christians, but they're not living like Christians. Number two, he says, follow the apostles' example in verse seven to nine. It says, uh, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. So these are the living examples that Christ left for us to follow the apostles. Notice he said, we weren't a burden. We, we had a right to live off of what you gave to us. Well, after all, we preached the gospel to you. We taught you. We gave you spiritual things. But we didn't take advantage of that right because of your immaturity. We didn't want to burden you with this. And I've mentioned this before. Isn't that what we do with our missionaries? We support, for example, Jeffrey Karima. Why? Because we don't want Jeffrey to have to take money from all these small young churches that he's planted. Uh, and, and, and have anyone think that he's doing what he's doing for them for money. So we support him, and that's usually the thinking behind mission work, right? We send somebody out, we pay their expenses, so on and so forth, so they'll preach the gospel, and hopefully the church that they plant will grow and will mature to the point where they can eventually pay for their own evangelists. But usually that takes a couple of years before that happens. So we, you, know, you ask, well, where did we ever get the idea of doing things that way? Well, this is where we get the idea of doing things. We get it from, that's how they did it then. And so that's how we do it now. So follow the example of the apostles, not just in mission work, but follow the way they lived and they conducted themselves. They should be 
an example. Some people say, uh, you know, why, why do we have deacons? You, know, you don't need to be a deacon to do the job. You don't need to be an elder to do the job. No, but, but elders and deacons, ministers, you know, they're appointed to their task. And part of their task is also to demonstrate a certain level of Christian maturity, a certain level of Christian uh, uh, activity, and so on and so forth, to provide some sort of type for others to follow, especially young Christians. Okay? Number three, he says, remember and obey the teachings, verses 10 to 12. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. So the apostles taught on the subject of right living in the Lord. And he says, remember this type of teaching and teach it to the ones who need to obey it. You know, in all matters, notice this is the passage where he refers to those who were just kind of slacking. I like that word busybodies, you know? People just getting into everybody's business, you know what I'm saying? Instead of minding your own business. Rule number one, to stop church division, mind your own business. <laughs> you know, mind your own business. It's very tempting, is it? We live at close quarters. We meet two, three, four times a week and we work together and we do stuff together. We're like a, we are a family, right? And in all families, right? Let's face it, stuff happens. We know stuff about other people. It's so tempting, isn't it, to share. I'm just sharing. <laughs> I'm just sharing about her impending divorce. I'm just sharing. It's very hard you know, to just go. Do you ever have this moment? <gasps> what? Nothing, it's okay, good. No, no, what, what, what? No. And in your mind you're saying, come on, talk me into it, I'll. <laughs> and we have to learn to say, no, it's good, it's, it's all right, never mind. Doing that has saved the church, you know, one more fissure, you know what I mean? A fissure, a little crack in its unity. Not you know, dragging out bad stuff, very important. Very important. So remember, he says, remember and obey the teachings of the apostles on all matters, especially our relationship issues in the, in the church. In the following verse, verse 13, he says, don't be discouraged, right? So, so far, stay aloof, follow the examples of the apostles, remain and uh, remember and obey their teachings, and don't be discouraged. But as for you, he says, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. Don't be tired of doing good, of working hard and encouraging those who are not doing good and working hard. Don't, don't, you know, don't give up on that. God will reward you. This is His promise, so don't quit. More people quit the church because they're discouraged. They do a lot of good things, they serve you know, quietly, blah, blah, blah. Never get any attaboy. Never get any attaboy. Never get a, you know, we really think you're doing a great job. I mean, uh, so, uh, men are not allowed to serve there, but you know, the, a lot of the young women and women serve in the nursery. Is that like a thankless task or what? That's <laughs> why so it's the hardest thing to get done. We're always looking for somebody to, to watch the, the nursery or the toddler room or teach in the young classes. You know? And some women have been in there teaching not months, but years. And uh, you know, I don't see a lot of gifts laying around on the, on the floor in the classroom for those teaching, you know, they don't get an attaboy. And so sometimes they just quit. They say, you know, I've had enough, and they never do it again. Because everybody needs, at some point, everybody needs to be told, you know, you're doing a great job, I know it's hard, thank you so much, my children love you. you know. One of the reasons uh, that they hardly miss is because they love you, they love this class, you know, so thank you. you know, you're making a big difference in the life of my child. Whoa, you know, Judy's been a teacher you know, for so long. Doesn't that feel good huh, when somebody comes in? Feels great. And let's face it, we're an army of volunteers, aren't we? We're, we're an army of volunteers. And so volunteers, you know, they're, they're not working for the money, and they're not, even, they're not working for glory. People who come in and clean, or change light bulbs, or change the dirty screen, you know, the filters, you know, drain the, the baptistry with all the tadpoles in it. And 
whatever those things are that are floating around. So there are a lot of you know, secret, silent, behind the scene, thankless tasks that go on in, a, in any congregation. Uh, people, need to be, people need to be encouraged. And Paul is saying, don't be discouraged. Try to remember that the reward that you get is from the Lord, even if you're not getting one here or an encouragement here. All right, he keeps going. He says number five, whoops, number five, discipline the disobedient. He says, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So they had to continue to warn and teach the disobedient and unrepentant one while remaining separated from him. And that's where we make the biggest mistake. If we ever pull back from someone who is really in disobedience to the Lord and you know, so on and so forth, we do the pulling back, but we rarely do the keep on teaching them. <laughs> keep on reaching out to them. Keep on calling and saying. You know. Keep on encouraging them. They had to do this unpleasant task and still remember that this was a brother and needed to be disciplined in love. One of the reasons that there is often division and trouble in the church is the reluctance to discipline correctly those members who are not following the teachings of Christ. And uh, you know, we could do like a whole series on just this one passage here. It's such a complex. There's so many reasons why we discipline people in the church, but there are also various ways to discipline people in the church, not just here in, in Thessalonians, but in Romans and in other places throughout the New Testament. We have instruction on how to discipline people for different reasons. Some who are unruly, if you wish, you know, busy bodies, gossips, troublemakers in the church, there's one way to discipline them. And then there's a whole other way to discipline someone who's teaching something which is false, who's purposefully teaching something which is contrary to the scriptures. There's a whole other way to deal with that situation. And then there's a whole other way to deal with a situation where there's a conflict between two brothers, two sisters, whatever, you know, one-on-one -on -one conflict. There's even another way to kind of approach that problem. So there's no one-size-fits-all type discipline uh, for the New Testament or for the church. We have to know all the various ones that are uh, listed for us in, in different places. So Paul uh, mentions one particular type here, and that's for an individual in the church, not causing division, not causing you know, huge division. I mean, he's not saying this person here is teaching some false doctrine, you know, Jesus is really not the Son of God or anything like that. Just a person who's kind of a bit of a troublemaker in the church, you know, not following uh, along, uh, uh, being a gossip. Uh, you know, just, uh, so he, he says, you, you need to point that out to that individual and you need to pull back from that individual, but you need to keep reaching out and loving that individual until they come back. You know, isn't that what we do with our kids? Time out. <laughs> Time out doesn't mean take your clothes, get out of the house, and never see us again. I know it's tempting, but... <laughs> right? Time out means time out. You, you can't, you're fighting with your sister and you're smacking your little brother in the head. Obviously, you can't play with the other kids. Time out. Go sit in your room. I'll let you know when you, oh, Ma, please. No, 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 you haven't had enough. Stay in there. Well, this is a kind of a time out here for this Christian person not throwing them out of the church or anything like that, it's time out. The elders perhaps, ministers have gone to that individual and say, no, no, you, you need to make a change in your life. And until that time, you know, we, we're not going to have fellowship with you. All right, so discipline those who refuse to repent. So obviously, this is a kind of a short list of the type of things that Christians ought to be doing. But in Thessalonica, these Christians definitely had to focus on these areas in order to remain a viable church. So he finishes up with some closing remarks here. He's thanked them, he's taught them, he's exhorted them, and now he closes his letter with a variety of separate closing thoughts for the Thessalonians to kind of think about. So we look at verse 16. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance the Lord be with you all. So God is with them in every situation and His presence is what brings them the peace that they want and the peace that they feel. You feel peace in your life, that means that the Lord is with you, giving you that peace. 
Verse 17, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter, this is the way that I write. So he's saying this letter is genuine. They may have received fake reports in the past, which led to confusion and disturbed their sense of peace. Remember he said some of them are thinking the Lord has already come or the Lord is coming tomorrow. How did they, how did they get that information? Maybe somebody wrote them a letter pretending that they were an apostle or something like that. So he's saying, hey, I am an apostle, this is a genuine letter. They can follow its, its, its instructions with confidence. He probably had someone else write the letter as he dictated it and then signed it with his own, his own hand. And the reason for that is some scholars think that you know, the thorn in the flesh that he talks about, some scholars think that the thorn in the flesh was poor eyesight that, necessity, uh, that uh, you know, required this type of arrangement and it also produced this unusual signature that he talks about. That's only speculation, but they're thinking, you know, if his eyesight was impaired, then he needed help getting around, he couldn't write, he had a lot of limitations, if you wish, and the idea of him you know, just signing the letter, a very unusual signature, suggests that. We don't know, we'll ask him when we see him, so that's the, uh, that's the way that goes. In verse 18, the last verse, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, be with you all offers a final blessing on the church. So if they have the Lord's favor upon them, there is nothing that could harm them and their blessings in future are secure. All right, so in this final chapter, we see people who have believed the truth and this truth is what separates them for those who are in the darkness and who will be punished when Jesus returns. He makes this clear in this letter. And in his closing portion, Paul does three things. One, he encourages them to pray that the truth will continue to spread. Prayer, as I said, is the fuel of the gospel and people want them to pray to this end. Secondly, he commands action. He commands them to take action against those who are living in a disorderly way within the church. You know, when I was uh, working in Montreal, we had a lot of this. We had to do a lot of this uh, because the people that were converted, many of them uh, were very poor. Uh, they had come from backgrounds, you know, third, like third generation on welfare, for example. The grandfather was on welfare, the father a lifetime on welfare. The kids were now, the young men, you know, 20 years old, perfectly healthy guys, but they had scammed such and gotten on welfare. I mean, perfectly healthy guys. Then they heard the gospel. And it was like, whoa, this is fantastic, you know? But then after a while, we had to slowly kind of bring them along and say, you know, <laughs> If you want to follow the Lord, when we, and I, we taught First and Second Thessalonians, and it's funny, here I focused more on you know, the end times and what's going to happen, because you know, I thought this was really might be of interest to you as a class, and less so on you know, everybody got to get a job, because I'm looking around, everybody here's got a job. But in Montreal, it was the opposite. I, I did go over the, the idea about the end times and so on and so forth. It was a very young church. But boy, we spent many weeks talking about get a job. Get a job. And if you think that's easy to hear, if you've been on welfare for like three generations, it's a way of life. The way of life was, I have a job, a side job that I do, that I collect cash for, but I make sure that I do not disturb the free money coming from the government. Make sure that I can do both of those. And you know, we lost a lot of people when we explained to them that that was not ethical. If you're healthy, if you're a 25 year old man in perfect health, you have no reason to collect welfare and then work and collect money under the table. That's, no, you can't be doing that. And we lost people because of that. And believe it or not, we, have to, we used to have debates in class about people defending this idea. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not against, quote, Social Security or Medicare or you know, welfare. You know. it's, it's a safety net. I understand that. We live in a society that provides a safety net for when we get in trouble or sick or whatever. But this was not a safety net. This was, this was gaming the system from the day of birth. We had people having children to just get an extra check because in Quebec you get what's called family allowance. In other words, if you have a baby, the government will send you, how much help? 200 bucks a month, because you have a baby. It's to help, to help out. 
you have two babies, you get $400 a month. If you have three babies, you get more. You see what I'm saying? So you get your welfare check, you get your baby bonus. Who wants to work? All right, so he commands action. So that was you know, the focus of our teaching and exhortation was this. And then number three, he exhorts them to follow. Follow his example in the way they live their everyday lives. So for, for the leaders of the church who read this, it says, be an example. You be an example. For those who have been in Christ a lifetime, even if they're not, quote, in a leadership position, you know, elder, big, whatever, but they've been a Christian a lifetime, when they read this, it's be an example. Some have to follow someone's example, but there has to be people in the church who can lead by example. It works both ways. So the theme of these lessons in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians has been be ready because the Lord is coming. Note that Paul in the closing section of his second letter actually spells out the type of things that all Christians need to be doing in order to be ready. And so in order to be ready, all Christians need to believe the truth. You see, the reason people perish is because they ultimately end up believing a lie. They either believe as true that Jesus is not God. They believe that lie or they believe that Jesus is not the Lord, they believe that lie, or they believe that Jesus is not the Savior, they believe that lie, or they believe that God will not punish sinners, they believe that lie, or they believe that there is no God, they believe that lie. See what I'm saying? It's the belief of what is false that condemns a person in the end. So in order to believe the truth, however, we need to, you know, we need to want to believe Hebrews 11.6, those who come to God must believe that He is and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You have to want to believe, you have to be looking for God. And we, want, we, we have to hear the gospel, right? Romans 10.17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the words of the Lord. And we've need, we need to believe the truth, right? What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, right? But those who, who, who do what? who do the will of my Father. And in order to continue believing what is true, we need to continue hearing God's word, and we need to continue obeying God's word. So believing the truth is not a once in a lifetime event like baptism. If you're baptized in the correct way, you only have to do that one time. You know, I've always said, you know, for salvation, you need, to, you need to believe the correct thing about baptism, and you need to be baptized in the right way way. They work together. If you were baptized the wrong way, be baptized over again. If you were baptized the right way but for the wrong reason, be baptized over again. Does the Bible teach that? Absolutely. Acts chapter 19. Those, those individuals who had heard about the gospel, about John's gospel, they were immersed, but they were immersed for the wrong reason. They were immersed for John's baptism. That was the wrong reason. And so what happened? Did, did Paul say, ah, close enough, good enough, he didn't do that. No, 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 no. He rebaptized them. Why? Because they had been baptized the correct way for the wrong reason. So if you've been baptized the wrong way for the right reason, or if you've been baptized the right way for the wrong reason, you need to get these two things right. The right, the right way by immersion and for the right reason. And there are many right reasons in the Bible, right? You're baptized in order to be saved. You're baptized you know, because you uh, want to receive the Holy Spirit. You want to be a member of the church. You want the new birth, the new life. You want to be buried with Christ. But you're not, if you're baptized simply to demonstrate that you're already saved, no, sorry, that's, that's, there's nothing in the Bible that teaches, that teaches that. That's a popular misconception, okay? So believing the truth is not a once in a, a, a lifetime thing, it's an ongoing process, and in this process we go deeper and deeper in appreciation and understanding of God's word as we continue in study and obedience. You cannot appropriate truth without corresponding obedience. So growth in the knowledge of God's truth requires obedience to God's truth. See the difference? As you believe, so you become. What you believe changes you only when you respond to it in obedience. 
It's a two-part thing. Why, some, some have said, why am I not growing spiritually? Usually it's because you're not obeying the things that you know. That's why you're not growing spiritually. In order to be ready, we must also pray always. Paul prayed for them, they prayed for him. As Christians, we must be strong in prayer if we're to truly be ready. We have more good reason to constantly pray than the reference in Thessalonians. For example, we pray because Jesus, God's Son, He prayed often, so we pray. We pray because Satan is powerful and always at work, so we pray. We pray because God commands us to do it, so we pray. We pray because God answers prayer and prayer works, so we pray. In Ephesians, Paul tells us that the battles that, that we fight as Christians are not physical, even if the battlefield is physical. The wars and the conflicts here on earth are the results of spiritual activities going on in the spiritual realm, Ephesians 6.12. The armies of the earth fight many battles here, but are of no consequence in affecting the spiritual warfare above. Don't we see, don't we see the, the Antichrist, the spirit of, of unlawlessness taking place? Don't we see all the confusion going on in our, in our own country? All this business, all these race wars, black against white and so on and so forth, we see people stirring all this stuff. This isn't of Christ. This isn't of the Lord. Look at those two, several individuals who were killed. Why? Because they just didn't, you know, they didn't respond properly. And yet, what, yesterday? Two officers, two policemen were shot dead in their car. You know? I mean, look at the chaos taking place. Is this of the Lord? Of course not. This is not of the Lord. That's the evil one stirring up. And it's easy to stir up passions when you talk about race and culture. Very easy. <laughs> Here it's black and white. Go, go back to where I come from in Montreal. Most people are white. They're still at each other's throat because it's English against French. Yeah, you laugh. English, the same passion. English against French. And you have the same type of you know, demagogues you know, stirring the pot and getting people against one another, except it's English and French. It's either north against south, east against west, black against white, English against French, you know, Hindu against Muslim, whatever it is. There are always people stirring up to cause trouble. And all of these people that stir stuff up, they're not of the Lord. We need to kind of remember that. We see, the, we see the evil in the spiritual realm being played out on the very streets of our, of our nation. Let me just finish up. I know we've heard the bell last lesson. Let me just finish this. And then he says, stay busy, right? If we realize that laziness and idleness is a major contributor to the three Ds, then we will stay busy. And when I say the three Ds, depression, discouragement, division. What, what do the shrinks say? Well, I shouldn't say that. What do the psychologists say, psychiatrists say to their individuals who are suffering from depression? Aside from the therapy they receive, sometimes medication to help find some sort of balance there. Get busy. When you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you're going, well, for Christians, the first thing I do is pray. But I mean, after that, what's the, if you're depressed, what's the first thing you do? You know, make your bed. Make your bed. Because that'll start, that'll start a pattern for the day. Make your bed. And even if you're not going anywhere, go ahead and shave and do your thing and get dressed. Don't stay in your pajamas all day. I'm talking about people who are depressed and who are blue and down. You know. Get busy. Stay busy with the, with the little things. So whether it's in society in general or in our families or in the church, laziness contributes to the three Ds. Many times it isn't the actual work that's missing, it's the willingness. In every parable, what does Jesus teach? In every parable that talks about the return of the Lord, right? what is He teaching? You better be busy when He's coming. Be busy when He's coming. All right. So um, let's see, I think I had one more slide. There you go. Ask yourself, are, are, uh, am I ready for the second coming? Are we ready for the second coming? I hope this series of classes has helped you to understand some of the things that 
Paul teaches concerning the second coming, but most of all, I pray that we, we all of us, will be ready when the Lord comes. Thank you for your attention. God bless you.